I just uploaded a video where I read uh, Mystic of the Sands superb poem Amor Vacui um, which um, Amor Vacui is of course just a Latin translation of love of the void uh, there's something fairly zen-like or buddhistic in the title although um, I would argue that it's quite different from either one perhaps maybe a little bit zen-like but not quite um, I always mention that I am drawn to the sort of dark side of life uh, things like horror and um, despair and things like that fascinate me um, of course because I've you know, I've got some first hand knowledge of these things um, due to my past um, brush with severe depression in my early 20s um, love of the void what does that really mean or how would I interpret it um, Mystic of the Sands um, seems to take say a Lovecraftian view of the universe which is ultimately a sort of a cold empty meaningless um, void of a place and say mm, I like it here not in a way of oh I can't wait what I get you know I can't wait to see what I get to do here is as, as much as I just like it in and of itself because it suits me um, not even that it's particularly good um, it's just a love of that which is I mentioned the Lovecraftian uh, angle to it because one of the interesting things about Lovecraft I'm always bringing up in my videos is this idea that if we discover what reality really is we'll go insane and um, the only thing, again, there's something Zapfian in this too, the only thing that we can really do is kind of delude ourselves because of what really awaits us at the center of our existence. Um, <clears throat> I've been a sometime critic of Lovecraft and Zapfi, even though I'm drawn to both, uh, simply because of the categorical way that they draw their conclusions. Um, Lovecraft wrote an interesting story called Out of the Eons where he describes what happens when you discover reality and in the worst case scenario a human being is mummified and made to experience perpetual horror for eons and eons and eons now Lovecraft deals in eons he deals in um, billions of years whereas the human mind generally just deals with tens or hundreds or perhaps thousands and that's about it um, when we start talking about eons we tend to go into the theoretical whereas Lovecraft says how about the experiential of eons how about being in a bad place for a billion years a very 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 bad place but I always sort of said when I when I'm done reading Lovecraft I get this sense of what then because I follow him right into his view of the world right into his view of the universe existence itself and I say okay so I've suffered a billion eons of psychotic torment of insanity and terror and everything okay what's a billion eons in the span of infinity in this in the face of forever nothing really See, so one is first inclined to be intimidated by these sorts of concepts. But as you sort of wrap your head around them and, you know, mull them over and ruminate over it, that's some a great ruminator, um, you start to see, okay, so what's the difference in the face of eternity between a billion eons and ten seconds? There is none. Um we're talking finitude versus infinitude and finitude by its nature looks pretty puny compared to infinitude and I don't care how big your finitude is you're comparing it to something that is by its nature infinitely bigger now I read Amor Vacui and I'm not really sure if Mystic of the Sands meant it this way 
as sort of a kind of a the same sort of discovery as a Lovecraftian hero, if you want to call these people heroes, make. In other words, they open Pandora's box and they see what's in it, or they um, gaze into the forbidden pool and see the future and they don't like it and it shocks them to the um, nth degree of their being. But, okay, so all these things stare you back into the face, all these horrible realities. Okay, now what? Okay, you, you're shocked and you're disoriented and perhaps driven completely insane by it all. Okay, and now what? What happens after that? <laughs> um, you know, we're usually limited by the idea that um, human consciousness is finite, which we don't know if human consciousness is finite. I'm not making a case here for reincarnation, but I think that I'm staring the facts in the face when I say that we don't know. Um, so let's at least understand that we ultimately don't know whether or not our consciousness is infinite or finite. And I think staring into that possibility is enough to throw a lot of people into existential panic, um, or at least severe existential angst. What, you mean this just goes on forever? Wow. But think about that, though. Your worst nightmare can only last so long because nightmares are finite, whereas existence may be infinite. We don't know. How do you come to terms with that? How do you come to terms with the fact that we may be like, we may be in a situation where the line between existence and non-existence becomes either blurred or out and out meaningless? Um, because um, Anything that has any aspects is by its nature finite. But trying to grasp in your own mind the non-finite um, kind of disorients you, and it sort of you're very unanchored, as Zappi would say. You're 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 looking at things for what they are, as opposed to different manifestations of how things are. You're looking at reality itself instead of its various, I don't know, anchors, its various components, its various um, identities. You're looking at a, a unity as opposed to a multiplicity, or not just a multiplicity, but the various manifestations of multiplicity. And the unity itself can shock you um, just by considering it. It can actually horrify you. Um, just by considering it. And I think that that's kind of latent and unsaid um, in Lovecraftian horror. Uh, it's not so much the nature of the universe that horrifies us. It's, it's infinity. Um, I always say this, inevitably and invariably, the road simply goes off all known maps when you're thinking of things in a big picture type sense. You run out of props. Um, and you're left thinking, what is there? There's only that which is and that which perceives it. That's it. Um, there's nothing else. Whatever terms you want to use for that, um, being and non-being, um, in a tantric sense, it's uh, Prakriti and Purusha, uh, or whatever you, whatever terms you want to use. Um, Mystic of the Sands, in my reading of his poem, I said existence or non-existence is not really something one can argue. It simply is. And there is that which is, and that which perceives that which is. And is, is in a sense possibly a negative statement. There is nothing, but there is that which perceives nothing. There is that that perceives an absence. And to some people, the absence is horrifying to others. And Buddhism and Jainism seem to work this way. Um, the absence itself is that which is to be sought. Now, let's look at the sands instead of going to say horror vacui, in other words, terror of the void, 
classical nihilism with all its negative connotations. He says, why not love it? Um, why not love it for being what it is, for existence for being simply what existence is? Since we're ultimately creating all the forms and all the manifestations of that which is in our own minds, um, what difference does it make what the actual individual manifestations are? Um, there is simply that which is and that which perceives that which is. We seem to have the choice to like it or to dislike it, to embrace it or to run from it. Um, I read uh, Amor Vacui as someone who has engaged their faculty of choice. Uh, or, again, it might not even be this sophisticated. It might be a simple preference to say, I like this. I like that things are a void. I like the fact that things are like this. A sterile wasteland, an empty place. And I would say that it is entirely possible to feel this way. And I would say that for people who are taking a macro picture of existence in the cosmos, it might be a very useful skill to cultivate. <laughs>